We're here to celebrate a love story. A love story between a man and his God, a man in the Bible, a man in his church, and a man and his family. And you're going to hear all of that uh, as we go through, the, through this service. Uh, Terry was a man who was very passionate about worship, very passionate about the Word of God. You're going to hear that will come out very clearly as the family and friends and uh, co-pastors share messages. You're going to hear from a lot of people who know the story. But up front, um, there was a book written about Terry called The Miracle at Darien and his ministry in Darien, Connecticut. And it is a, a book about ministry. It's a book about church growth. It's a book about theology. It's a book about loving your family. It's all in one volume. And uh, they're not easy to find because people wanted to charge me three and four hundred dollars for used copies of them. And uh, but we, we did find some and we're going to put them out in our church library. Uh, but one of the difficulties about moments like this is you realize kind of how you've been shorted. Because some of you do Terry very well. Some of you are here to support the family. But what an incredible ministry this man had. First, I want to thank you all for being here today. And I want to thank those who are celebrating the life of my father through the live streaming of this service. Many thanks to Tom Hendrickin, Bruce Colgate, and our very own Shane Stan for making that possible. The last month has felt a little surreal. Losing my father on March 15th, and then two days later, leaving to take a group to Israel and Jordan, returning home, and taking care of all the details that are required when someone passes away, all while trying to take care of our hurting family planned for the weekend and midweek services here at Tomoka. Through this difficult time, I have truly felt God's arms wrapped around me, and I have felt the prayers from people around the world. It has been what has held up our family. My father was an amazing man. I think deep down inside I always knew that, but it really was only in the last seven years that the magnitude of what he accomplished here on this earth was made known to me. My husband Charles and I and our family have had the wonderful privilege of caring for my mom and dad in our home these past seven years. We can see that my father was requiring more and more care over the years after suffering a major stroke, and that it was becoming increasingly more difficult for my mother to care for him by herself. We decided to move in together, and it was the best decision that we ever made. After giving virtually all of his life to serving others in the local and global church, we now had the honor of ministering to and serving him. I want to publicly thank my wonderful husband, Charles, for all his help with my dad. I could never have done it without his constant love and support. My dad loved his family very deeply, and he was truly happiest when he was surrounded by his wife, children, and grandchildren. Growing up, the day never went by without him saying to all of us, have I told you today that I love you? He would also tell all of us that we were the most loved whatever age we were child in the whole world. <laughs> How precious it was to have that affirmation every day. My brother and I were also incredibly blessed to be taught how to play the piano by my father. For many years, my brother would have a lesson at 5.30 a.m. and then I would have one at 6.30 a.m. After school, in the late afternoon, when he would return from teaching at the college, we would then both have an other hour lesson each. Imagine, my father spent four hours of his life every day for years pouring his love of music into his children. What an incredible gift that was to us. It played a huge part in laying the foundation for the ministry that I do today. Eventually, his ministry responsibilities grew so much as he began to travel all over the world on teaching missions that I had to go to a private teacher. I was lost for a while, as I now had to learn how to practice on my own, not an easy thing to do, when you have had your teacher sitting by your side telling you exactly what to do and how many times to practice a certain section. <laughs> One of the blessings of his ministry was that he got to travel all over the world. He would bring us with him as much as possible. He told my mother when they were first married, stick with me, kid, and you'll see the world. <laughs> wow, was that a true statement, not only for my mother, but also for his children, and in later years, his grandchildren. These trips are memories for all of us that will last a lifetime. The last trip we took together was just two years ago when we drove my parents up to the New England area. We had stopped in at St. Paul's, and Reverend Christopher Lane, who is here today, graciously showed us around the rectory that we had lived in for over 17 years. 
My father thanked us over and over and over again, knowing he could not have physically done the trip without the help of his whole family. My father was the real deal. He truly practiced what he preached. I can honestly say that I never once heard him speak an unkind word about someone in the church or openly share any frustrations that he may have had. Over the years, this has become even more impressive to me, as I am sure you all know or can imagine how difficult church ministry can sometimes be. Our Father loved the church. He loved St. Paul's and the wonderful people there. The faith of the vestry and leadership there that allowed my father to travel and be away so much from ministry while still carrying on his duties as the rector of St. Paul's says a lot. It was at St. Paul's that I first experienced incredible spirit-led worship as my father would teach and then lead the congregation in song, again laying more of the foundation that would impact the rest of my life. After his retirement due to the stroke, he became deeply saddened when many in the Episcopal Church and other churches began to move away from what Scripture teaches. One of the reasons my father loved this church, where my husband Charles and I are blessed to be worshiping creative arts pastors, was that Pastor Joe was not afraid to stand on what the Word of God says, and he does not shy away from preaching the truth, no matter how difficult or controversial the subject. He also loved how the staff here was made up of people from all denominations. My father prayed for the church worldwide and lifted its leadership up, leadership up on a daily basis. Some of the great leaders in the Episcopal Church are in this room today, and some are watching through live streaming. He was very encouraged to know that you all are still out there fighting the good fight. Thank you for your ministries and for standing on the truth of God's word. As most of you know, my father also loved to worship. He was not afraid at all of the more contemporary styles of worship that we have here at Tomoka. Many of you may remember him saying that he believed that God had to be at least as contemporary as his people. <laughs> it was always wonderful to have his total support for our ministry. I want to thank all of the wonderful people who sent him letters over the years and shared with him what his ministry meant to them and how it impacted their lives. You have no idea how encouraging and touching those letters were to my father and mother. It is a blessing to get to hear in this lifetime how your life has positively impacted someone else's life. And I just want you to know that my parents treasured those letters. It has made me want to reflect and take time to thank the people in my life that have made a difference. I encourage everyone to do this. I would also like to thank John Tiffany for helping to keep my father's legacy of teaching the Bible alive by putting all of his sermons on a website called lifeonwings.org and creating an amazing resource for people. He has spent many hours every day for the last two years of his life listening to my dad's voice while digitizing the messages and compiling scripture references, etc. Our whole family is truly grateful for this. Like I said, my father was the real deal. He led all of his children to the Lord, baptizing all three of us in the Jordan River. In fact, some of my earliest memories are having Bible study together as a family after dinner every night and singing scripture songs to tunes that my father had made up. I also have many memories of him in the den at home studying scripture and crafting life-changing messages. I sat with him on the organ bench during many services at St. Mark's in Riverside, Rhode Island as he led the choir and congregation in worship. Through his witness, all of his grandchildren have come to know the Lord as well, and I know that there are literally thousands in heaven because he dared to use the gifts and talents that God had given him to reach the lost and bring them to the saving knowledge of our Savior, Jesus. I can't begin to imagine the party in heaven when he went to be with the Lord on March 15th at 1 p.m. We spent that morning before he passed away singing every hymn and worship song that he loved that we could think of and every scripture song that he had ever taught us. We worshiped together one last time as he entered the ultimate and infinite worship service in heaven. I mentioned before that one of my father's favorite phrases was, stick with me, kid, and you'll see the world. Well, Dad, I am extremely blessed and grateful that I got to do that here in this earth. And now I'm going to stick with Jesus just like you taught me and follow your amazing examples so that one day we can be reunited together in heaven. Have I told you today that I love you, Dad? I do, and I always will. He had that wondrous ability to be able to speak both passionately out of his heart, clearly out of his mind. 
in a way that was unflinching in its commitment to truth and in seeing Jesus exalted in all things. And when I saw that happening in a man's life in ministry, a part of me just relaxed inside. Okay, there may be room for someone who has wants to do some of the same things. I'm not Terry Fuller. I don't even mean to suggest that. But I do mean to suggest that he paved the way for a lot of other people who would never have imagined that God might have called them to be all of who they are within the context of the Episcopal Church. That's still true. I would even go so far as to say, particularly given the impact that he had on many here, in Central Florida that I doubt very seriously that I would ever, ever have been called to be the Bishop of Central Florida were it not for the impact and the lasting impact of the life, ministry, and witness of Terry Fuller. So I, I really am someone who is profoundly in his debt and always grateful that God raises up pioneers who are willing to pave an unfamiliar way for many others behind them who will go, oh, okay, I think I can go this way and see in it the hand of God. <coughs> and so for that, I'm extraordinarily grateful. So for his life and witness, for the legacy that you uphold as his family, I'm extraordinarily grateful. Thank you very, very much. I want to thank God and <coughs> Pastor Joseph for his great generosity, letting us all come up here. Thank you very much. Bishop Greg, you're a tough act to follow, but that's all right. I succeeded Terry Fulham at St. Paul's very <laughs> end. But the good news is there was 10 years between us. <coughs> it's hard to believe Father Fulham concluded his ministry 25 years ago. And the fruit continues to grow, continues to last, to the Father's glory. One thing I just want to say, he taught us how to understand ourselves. He showed us who we are. We are members of Christ's body. He taught us many other things, but this is the one thing I want to remember. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1.18, and it's throughout the scriptures as well. And he said the body, the church is the body of Christ. It's not a building. An organism, not an organization. Christ is the head of the body. We are the members of the body of Christ. We are the ministers of the church. He would tell us stories, wonderful stories, about how in most churches the minister ministers and the congregation what? Congregate. Congregates. It's like going to a stadium full of people on a Sunday afternoon, 60,000 people in desperate need of, wait a minute, let me get it right, of exercise, watching 22 people on the field in desperate need of a rest. Come on, we're all ministers in the body of Jesus Christ. Every member is a minister. And what is your ministry? What is my ministry? Well, we know there's ministry within the body. Members ministering one to another. We know Christ through one another. We also are to make Christ known. This is the great mission of St. Paul's, to know Christ and to make him known, and that is the mission of every Christian organism, every member of the body. We've done a lot, ministering to the body in Darien. People have come over the years to be ministered to, to learn about Jesus being the head of the church, to bring that back to their congregation. But I must say, not too many people come to St. Paul's anymore for that way. And it's as though we're in another season. 
The ministry of the church has got to be outside of the walls of the building. We don't have very many seeker people coming to our church on Sunday. If you have it here, God bless you. It's a calling for some. But all of us need to get outside of the church building and open our homes and open our offices and go to where people are in parks, on the streets, and find them because what's missing matters to God. The ministry in the body needs to also go beyond the body. And we are seeing the kingdom expand at the edges in Connecticut. By the grace of God, I spent every week of my life for the last two years in Newtown, Connecticut, because there was some DNA of St. Paul's in Sandy Hook already through prior ministry and one of our members living there. God allowed for us to start praying for the people in June 2012, so that in December 2012, we have been praying for six months for the people to know their need for God. Well, if they would admit it, after December 14, 2012, they knew their need for God. And by the grace of God, we've been able to slowly, sort of under the radar, minister in Jesus' name to families, all of the citizens of that town and beyond. Christ is the head of the body. We are members of his body. We are his ministers. We know Christ and we make him known.